Anybody have one of those holiday dinners coming up that you're just hoping, hoping that you get deathly ill right before so you have a reason to get out of it? Now, nobody wants to get deathly ill, but here's my point. It's not uncommon for families to want to be able to get together and have that joyous Thanksgiving dinner, and yet what your experience tells you is that when you get together, if so-and-so shows up, everybody's going to leave angry. <laughs> Do you know that feeling? Yeah, most families have that person. And if you don't know who that person is in your family, you know what that could mean. <laughs> and you say, I just want, all I want is turkey and cranberry sauce out of a can. That's all I want. The good, you know, the good cranberry sauce out of the can with the built-in sizes so you can chop it perfectly every time. And they thought of everything. That's all I want. But no, you know there's going to be this happening. And that can put a pit in your stomach too. You could be like so many people who coming this holiday season, it's going to be the first time where someone that you dearly love isn't going to be around that table. And, and that can put it in perspective as well. So what do we do with all of that? Well, last week we saw that there are two kinds of storms in this life. And nobody's immune from difficult times, but one kind of storm is the storm that's happening in the world around you. The other kind of storm is the storm that's happening within you. And what we saw is that Jesus demonstrated when he was asleep in the boat, when the storm was raging on the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus demonstrated that when you have a connection with God, like he did, just because there's a storm raging around you, it doesn't mean there has to be a storm raging within you. And that's the promise for every Christian. And last week we talked about how practicing the presence of God, being reminded that God is with you, and taking those moments when anxiety begins to rise inside of you to stop and breathe Remember that God is with you, and then invite God to speak to you, asking questions like this. God, is there something about this situation that you see different than the way I see it? Or God, is there something that you want me to know about what's happening in me that I don't presently know? That simply learning to practice God's presence two or three minutes at a time to pause and reflect and listen and pray can change everything. I heard somebody um, tell a story last week who said, um, guess what? I actually did it. And this week I was having constant challenges with anxiety and every time I would stop and I would remind myself that God was with me and I would ask God to speak to me and he began to show me things that I didn't see and didn't know and through that my anxiety just diminished and peace took its place. That's what I'm talking about. That's, that's available for all of us. And so today, we're going to look at a second practice, and that's the practice of thankfulness. And we're going to be, see that in Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse number 4. So if you have a Bible, open it up. Uh, I'm reading from a translation called The Bible for Everyone, and it'll be on the screen behind me as well. Verse 4 says, celebrate joyfully in the Lord all the time. Everybody say all the time. All the time. Just in case you didn't hear me, I'll say it again. Celebrate. Let everybody know how gentle and gracious you are. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything. Rather, in every area of life, let God know what you want. And as you pray and make requests and give thanks to God as well. And God's peace, which is greater than we can ever understand, will keep guard over your hearts and minds in King Jesus. Father, I pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts today, that your word would become real, that you would heal where we need to find healing and strengthen where we need to be strengthened, that we could walk in that peace that surpasses all understanding because you guard our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul opens, Paul, who's probably in Rome, 
writes to the church in Philippi, and the first thing that he says in this section of scripture is celebrate joyfully in the Lord all the time, and again, I say celebrate. Now, you may think, well, Paul, that's easy for you to say because you're probably writing this letter from a cruise ship in between pickleball and shuffleboard. (laughs) Because you you probably have no idea the kinds of challenges I'm facing. Your biggest challenge is, is there a pool chair available for me after lunch? But that's actually not where he's writing from. In fact, Paul is writing from prison. And while he's in prison, his future is uncertain, his freedom is limited, and he's basically out of control of whatever happens next in his life. And it's important to catch that because these letters, the, the, the epistles are so often not written from these ideal situations into ideal situations. The scripture is given to us in the midst of the nitty-gritty realities of life, the challenges that are much like the challenges that you face today. And so when, when Paul says celebrate, and again I say celebrate, it's not just hypothetical. He's, he's not just blowing smoke. He's actually in prison saying There is something that Jesus has done in my life that has so radically transformed the way I see the world that yes, while I am in prison, I will say to you, celebrate. And again, I say celebrate. So what we're going to see here as we move through is why. Why Paul can say that with such confidence and we'll come back to that at the very end. What we're going to do for the next couple of minutes is move from worry through thanksgiving, finally to see how God's peace will guard your heart and your mind as well. And the first thing that that he points to is this. If you're taking notes, write this down. To begin the process, find the source of your worry. Find, Find the source of your worry. Pause for a second, and I want you, if you would, whether you're online or you're here in the room, Pause for a second and think about what have you been worrying about this week? Now, don't don't shout it out. Did you get something? What if I were to tell you that the thing you're worried about probably isn't actually the thing you're worried about? Hold on to that thought for a second. Paul says right out of the gate, don't worry about anything. And if you're like me, when you're struggling with something and somebody comes up to you and says, oh, don't worry about it, my first response is not thank you. My first response is I'd like to smack them upside the head. <laughs> because how, how, how unhelpful is it for somebody to say, oh, man, that, I can tell you've got so much on your mind. Do you know what you really need to do? Stop it. Well, thanks. But when we dig a little bit deeper and understand why he would say it that way, we'll understand that he has a different picture, different relationship to worry than maybe you do. Because most of us have one of two relationships to worry. One relationship you can have to worry is this. You, when you start to feel worried or anxious, you stuff it, you ignore it, and you pretend like it's not affecting you. Do we have any, any stuffers in the room? And listen, I love stuffers. Stuffers are great people to have around sometimes. And I mean this seriously. Seriously, stuffers are really good when trouble hits. Because stuffers don't get overwhelmed by that initial feeling of anxiety. They, they're the ones that will like run into the fire. They make great first responders oftentimes. Oftentimes, if you've had a hard, difficult, challenging life and you haven't quit, you, you may have developed some stuffing skills because life's been hard and you've just, you've just stuffed it down so you can survive. And sometimes we got some survivors in the house, but along with surviving came this habit of stuffing. 
The other relationship people can have to worry is to surrender to it and let it consume you. So when you start to worry, you're, all you talk about is what you're worried about. All you post on Facebook is what's wrong with the world around you and what, what you're worried about. All, all, you, all you think about is what your worry consumes you. It's just constantly the story that plays. This could go wrong. That could go wrong. This could go wrong. And so on one hand, you're a, there are people who are stuffers, and they're like the, the knight in Monty Python <laughs> who gets in the sword fight, and he like loses a leg and loses an arm, and, and he keeps saying, it's merely a flesh wound. <laughs> And you're just living in this false reality. On the other hand, you can be like an Eeyore, that you just walk around, and everything's bad in this world, and the, world, the sky is falling. But neither of those responses is a healthy response to where it's not, it's not what helps us get to what's underneath. And I love what, um, um, I love what one pastor said whose name escapes me, he said, your feelings and your emotions should be treated like kids on vacation. Ready? When you go on vacation with the kids, you don't put them in the trunk of the car and pretend like they're not there, but you also don't let them drive the car. How do we get underneath and find the source of our worry? That's what's important. There's a pastor named Tim Keller, and he says something like this about fear, and I've kind of kind of adapted it because I think it, it's true for our worry as well. This is what he says. My worries are directly proportional to the vulnerability of the things that are my greatest joys. Think about that. My worries are proportional to the things that are my greatest joys. In other words, whatever I look to for significance, acceptance, and security, the more vulnerable those things that I look to for significance and success are, then the more my life will be plagued with worry. Because the more that the things I put my hope in are likely to fail me, then the more I have to live with the anxiety that, that I don't know if I'm going to get the needs that I have met by the things that I've trusted in to meet those needs. Are you tracking with me? So we may say, well, I'm worried about money because prices are going up and my, my income's not going up with it. But is that really what you're worried about? Are you more worried, am I going to be okay? Or am I going to be able to provide for the people that I care about? And, and I'm a provider. If I can't provide, I don't know who I am. And see, we find ourselves putting not just expectation, but our hopes into these things that are ultimately vulnerable. And you know deep down inside that when your hopes are in people to make you feel accepted, your hopes are vulnerable. You know that what, and here's the rest of what he says, if the thing that is my greatest joy is God, I will live without worry. If my one thing, the thing I want and need the most is God, I am safe. St. Augustine said something similar to this. He, he said that our anxieties are actually helpful because it tells you a lot about what enslaves you because worries tend to reflect the collapse of a false god. So then what do we do? Once we begin to see the source of our worries where we've placed our hope in things that are vulnerable, here's the second thing that he speaks to, to relocate your hope. If you begin to anchor yourself in something that is unreliable, worry will inevitably be the result of that. Once you've discovered what that is, then you can relocate your hope to something or someone that will not fail you. The only way to stop worrying is to replace your worry with trust. Anybody that tells you just stop worrying, they don't understand worry. 
But when somebody says, maybe you could shift what you're dwelling on to something that can provide you with a hope that is secure, now you're talking to somebody that may understand what's going on. What he goes on to say in this scripture is, is this, rather in every area of life, let God know what you want, so don't worry. Rather, in every area of life, let God know what you want, and as you pray and make requests, give thanks as well. So what he says here is stop worrying, but the next thing you're going to do is you're going to talk to God about everything you need and everything you want. It's not just don't think about it anymore. In fact, if you are a habitual worrier, you've already developed the very habit that the scripture is telling you to develop. You just need to reorient the focus of your thinking and dwelling and meditating from the hopelessness of Who's going to provide this for me to God? I've got some things I need to talk to you about. Because the Bible doesn't endorse denial that says, I'm not worried and pretend like it's not that bad. The Bible doesn't endorse fatalism that says whatever happens, happens. The Bible doesn't endorse humanism that says, well, it'll be whatever you make out of it. The Bible doesn't even endorse over-spiritualizing the situation, which says, well, God's in control, so just don't even think about it or feel anything about it. The Bible doesn't endorse any of those things. What the Bible says is instead, shift your meditation from meditating on what's wrong or could go wrong to an honest conversation with God. Let me say this again. If you are a worrier, you already have the habits for a great prayer life. What needs to shift is what you do with those thoughts as they come. And, and Paul, what does he say? He says, make your request known to God. It sounds a lot like what the scripture says in Matthew chapter 6. But here's the point that you need to catch. When the Bible tells you to make your request known to God or tell God what you need, you need to remember that God's not asking you to tell him what you need because he lacks the information. At no point do you pray and God says, gosh, that's a great idea. I never thought of that. At no point do you pour your heart out to God and God says, I'm glad you told me because I wasn't paying attention. No, you see, when you learn to pray, when you pour your heart out to God, it's not because he needs to know something he doesn't already know. It's because until you start to give him your attention, you are going to be stuck in isolation. But the minute you begin to talk to God, you become aware that you're not as alone as you thought you were, and it's not as hopeless as it felt like it was, and that God's probably already working in ways, but you just don't see it yet. Worried is always amplified the more isolated you feel. And the minute you start to talk to God, it begins to break that isolation because you're reminded that you are not alone anymore. But that's not all. He doesn't say, just go around, God, I need this, and God, I need this, and God, I need this, and God, I need this. There's one more piece, and this is the practice that will change everything in your life when it becomes a part of your habit. It's this. You make your request known to God with thanks. You make your request known to God with thanksgiving. We're not talking about Turkey. We're making our request known to God with. Here's an example of what that sounds like from the psalmist. In Psalm 71, I want you to look for the needs that are expressed as well as the thanksgiving that's offered. Psalm 71 says this. Oh Lord, I have come to you for protection. Don't let me be disgraced.
My God, rescue me from the power of the wicked, from the clutches of cruel oppressors. Oh Lord, you alone are my hope. I've trusted you, O Lord, from my childhood. And and you have been with me from birth, from my mother's womb. You have cared for me. No wonder I'm always praising. But I will keep on hoping for your help. I will praise you more and more. I will tell everyone about your righteousness. All day long, I will proclaim your saving power. Though I am not skilled with words, I will praise your mighty deeds, O sovereign Lord. So it's like this. It's like, man, I, I am I'm really worried about going to work today because I don't know how my boss is going to feel about the last project that I just finished. And they tend, they tend to be so nitpicky and uh, my track record, I just, I don't know. And I'm anxious about it. I'm fearful about it. Hmm. I see. I'm putting a lot of weight on what my boss thinks about me. God, I need to talk to you about this because this, this job is actually really important to me. And I, and I really want to have a job where I can do well, where I can succeed, where I can feel like a contributor. And I don't, I don't know if this is the best job for me, but I really want to do well. And, and to be really honest with you, God, there are times where I just never feel like I'm good enough. And so I'm, just, I'm, I'm letting you know, I, I want that to change in me. Oh, yeah. But I also want to thank you. Because it wasn't that long ago when I didn't have this job and I didn't know what my next season of life was going to look like and I felt all turned upside down. And you came through and you brought this job at just the right time in just the right way. And I've made some good friends that I didn't expect to meet. And, and, and God, I remember that this morning when I got on the road, I watched the sunrise and it made me think about how powerful you are, that, that you created all of this and you hold it together. And I'm just, I'm really grateful for your provision. And by the way, Lord, thank you for that time in your word this morning because I had such a bad night's sleep last night, but after 20 minutes just reflecting on the scripture joy began to rise up in my heart and I'm I'm really thankful for that I'm telling you if we could become people who aren't captivated by our worry but instead we're motivated by our worry to find out what's underneath that and then make our request known to God, invite him into this situation, and then offer thanksgiving, I, you, will, you will change the world. You'll be unstoppable. And now we're... We're all the way back to the beginning. Why is it that Paul could start this whole section by saying celebrate joyfully in the Lord? It's because of something that he had grounded himself at the very beginning of this letter. This is what he says in, in verse number six, the very beginning of Philippians. This is what he says. Of this I'm convinced. The one who began a good work in you will thoroughly complete it by the day of King Jesus. You know, you know what he's saying? He's saying, I can pray in any situation and end up with thanksgiving and hope because I'm convinced of this, that I am part of a story and the author is the one who is risen from the dead.
And I was thinking about this. Do you know how many crazy things we put our hope in every day? Have you ever been driving on a two-lane road and there's a car coming in the opposite direction and you think, I have based my, my whole life on this fact that I trust that that person is gonna stay on their side of the white line or yellow line. You just take it for granted. How many people get up in a plane some people get anxiety, but there's a lot of people get up on the plane and they fly and, and it doesn't really cross their minds that they're, they're flying in a huge tin can, 30,000 feet in the sky with some guy or gal that you've never met in the front and you don't have any idea if they're, you know, who they even say they are. You didn't check their ID because you trusted the people at the airlines to do that. How about the last time you went out to a restaurant and you ate the food and you just trusted that somebody that prepared it, prepared it isn't giving you salmonella poisoning? You ever gone to the doctor and the doctor said, here, take this, and you just assume. You just trust. You are really good at trusting. And if you're a worrier, you're really good at praying. All you need to do is shift the aim of your trust and the content of your meditation, and you will be a person that walks in peace through the greatest storms that life can throw at you. But the ultimate reason that you can have hope and faith to live your life that way is not just because it's wishful thinking and it's good advice, it's this. The one who makes the promise that that peace is possible is the one who had to face the worst, the very worst of what Jesus could have possibly worried about. If Jesus could have possibly worried about people betraying him, it happened. Jesus could have worried about people abandoning him, and it happened. He could have worried about being misunderstood and lied about and wrongfully treated, and it happened. He could have worried about being put on a cross to face the most excruciating execution known to mankind. And the worst that he could have worried about, it came true. He didn't get any shortcut at all. But that's not the end of the story. And the gospel says, he, he took the worst of it, bore it head on, worse than anything that you would ever have to face on your own. And he took it, and it took him to the grave. But the power of God raised him back to life. And this is the promise. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is working in those who believe. And so if you wonder, can I really trust him? Is he really faithful? Then you look to the cross and you say, yes, because Jesus is alive today. I have a reason to be thankful. I have a reason to be hopeful. And worry may come at me, but worry doesn't have to captivate me. The storms may be real in my life, but I know the God above the storm. And that's where I will anchor my life and my hope. And I may see nothing but gale winds ahead of me, but this is the promise that even if, even if that's all I can see, there are things happening that I can't see. And so I put my trust in the one who is above the storm. And even if this storm takes me to the bottom, the promise is the bottom isn't the end. Because the gospel story says over and over and over again that there is a resurrection life on the other side of the tomb. And when you trust and give your life to Christ, you're no longer just walking around saying, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. No, the Holy Spirit is in you. He's helping you. He's healing you. He's restoring you. He's strengthening you. 